Thank you, Pastor Niaga. Good morning, church. It is so good to see all of you on this beautiful Sabbath morning. But before we start, I always have to remind some of us who are more forgetful that we should try to make sure that these distractions which are very helpful, especially for medical doctors or emergency workers. But while we're in church, I always encourage as much as possible to turn off the cell phone so that we can be not focused on the texts here, but rather on this text. What do you say? We want to spend time in the Word of God, so we want to make sure, and I'm turning my phone off right now myself to be a good example. I have just turned my phone off. During this week, we have been blessed by the opportunity to look back at the way God has led us in this church. And in the mornings, we've taken time primarily to dig deeply into the Word of God. And I hope, by God's grace, you have your Bible with you so that you can mark some texts. The major theme we've been focusing on is salvation simplified. Today is the 17th of August, 2024. And in the evenings, I have taken time mainly to look back 180 years to the year 1844 from the time that the Millerites were there and from the beginnings, the birth of this Seventh-day Adventist global movement that God has blessed us with. And I'm thankful that we are part of this global family. Today my message is specifically titled, The Lamb is the Lion. Would you say that after me? The Lamb is the Lion. And as we have taken time in the mornings, we've gone back to the Bible. More than once, we've gone to the book of Genesis. And again today, just by way of introduction, I want to remind you of that fateful day in the Garden of Eden when that serpent of old, the devil, came in the shape of that uh, snake there and uh, managed to deceive Eve. And you remember the story so well how Eve plucked and ate the fruit and gave to her husband and they sinned and as a result they would have died that very day if it had not been for the fact that an, an innocent animal died in their place. You know the background for the Bible story so well, I'm sure. That's Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And then in our week, this week, we took time to go to Genesis uh, chapter 37. I shared a little bit about the young man by the name of Joseph. How he had been favored by his father and his brothers had hated him. And eventually his brothers in chapter 37 of Genesis sold him into slavery. Don't miss this important point. A fate more to be feared than death. So we've been talking a little bit about the background here in the book of Genesis, and I know you've been blessed by other speakers dealing specifically with a focus on the issue of salvation simplified as looking at the sanctuary. Today I have a story that perhaps will illustrate in real time how this whole aspect of forgiveness happens. Now, when you see the story of Joseph, that ends in chapter 37, verse 36. In fact, listen to that verse there. Now the Midianites had sold him, that's Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. That is the end of Genesis chapter 37. Now, if you have in your Bibles, you can mark that there. Our Bible passages will be on the screen, most of them, if not all of them, so that we can stay in the same translation in the same language here. Now that's the last verse of chapter 37. You would expect something to happen in the next verse, but it doesn't happen. It's interesting, when you get to chapter 39, verse 1, listen carefully what the Bible says. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Did you notice verse 1 of chapter 39 and verse 36 of chapter 37 are almost an echo of themselves? Can you see that? I have color-coded it so that you can see it more easily. My wife is the one who's taught me a little bit of color coding. And you can see, like the red, the Midianites, down below, it says Ishmaelites. Now, the Midianites were the Ishmaelites. It's like in the United States, they have a group of people called the African Americans. Are they African? Are they American? No, African American. Are you with me? So these were Midianite Ishmaelites. These were Ishmaelites living in the land of Midian. So sometimes they call them Midianites, sometimes they call them Ishmaelites. 
But you'll see the rest of them, like Egypt is in green, like Potiphar is in orange, and officer of Pharaoh is in pink, etc. It's the same idea. Why? Why? Because right in the middle of these two chapters, there is this chapter that reads this way. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers, dot, dot, dot. Chapter 38 is all about Judah. Now, wait a minute. What's happening here in the Bible? We who believe the Word of God and believe the Bible is inspired, we have accepted the fact the Scripture points out that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Now, it appears to me that here is an intentional interruption in the story, in the text. Because it tells us about Joseph, then chapter 38 comes in the middle like the middle of a sandwich, a slice of bread on top, a slice of bread below, and in between is the rest. And it's interesting. So notice, there's an apparent attempt to contrast faithful Joseph with faithless Judah. Now we know they had the same father, right? That was Jacob. But there were many differences between the brothers. Let me share with you just a few. On the one hand, okay, we notice that Joseph was forced to leave home. When you read the story carefully of chapter 38, it shows that um, Judah freely leaves home. Joseph Repeatedly, it says more than seven times, the Lord was with Joseph. When it comes to the story of Judah, it appears that the Lord is against Judah. Interesting. On the one hand, you know the story so well in chapter 39, where Joseph runs away. He shuns sexual sin. And in the story of Judah, you can read it at home, he seeks out sexual sin. On the one hand, Joseph forgives his brothers before being asked. On the other hand, Judah condemns his daughter-in-law before evidence. It's a fascinating contrast. Very interesting. And for those of you who are English majors, one day I dream of writing a book. Uh, that, that, uh, that's a, a little play on the book written by that well-known Charles Dickens called A Tale of Two Cities. When you look at the story in the Bible, it's a tale of two siblings. All right? And so I one day want to write a book as a contrast between these two brothers because, let me ask the question, how many of you have heard at least one sermon, one story in church on the life of Joseph? Raise your hands. I would like to see. I expect every hand to raise, right? Everybody's heard of Joseph. How about, how many of you have heard at least one sermon on the life of Judah? Oh, almost nobody. Very few hands. You see, we don't hear about the other brother. So we want to spend a little time because on the one hand, we encourage our young people especially to be like Joseph when he fled from sin. But what about Judah? It's an interesting fact that we've got the story of Judah in between the story of Joseph, and it begins this way. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. Now notice the language, at that time. So we have to ask, at what time? Well, go back just a verse or two. Genesis 37 verse 34 says, Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. For whom was he mourning? What do you know? You know the backstory. The brothers had come along to their father with this coat of many colors that had blood on it, and they had said to him, Do you recognize this? And of course, he did recognize it. They, of course, had, were lying to their father because they know they had sold Joseph into slavery. And now they came with us trying to get their father to believe that Joseph had been torn to pieces by a wild animal. You know the story. And, 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 and Jacob believed that Joseph was dead. But here's the question. Why was it that only Judah departed? Yeah. Why only Judah? Why did he leave? Why not the other brothers? Of course, we have to remember part of the backstory when they had taken their brother Joseph, they'd thrown him into the pit. Then they saw these Midianite Ishmaelites coming along. Don't forget, the Bible indicates something interesting. Judah said to his brothers, what is to be gained by killing our brother and concealing his blood? Rather, let us sell him to these Ishmaelites instead of doing away with him ourselves. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. Who was the one that suggested they sell Joseph into slavery? It was Judah. So it appears from the storyline, 
that uh, maybe, maybe here was something happening in Judah's heart. Maybe when he saw his father weeping and wailing day in and out, he may have felt guilty, right? He was the one who said, let's get rid of Joseph. So what kind of a man was Judah? I would suggest he was a mercenary brother. He was making money off of his brother. He sold him for 20 pieces of silver. They divided up amongst the 10 brothers. Each one got two pieces of silver, and two pieces of silver was a lot of money. That was the equivalent of three months of wages for the, for the shepherd. It was a lot of money. Three months of, shep of wages for each of, the, of those ten shepherds. They made a lot of money from selling their brother Joseph. So let's continue now with the story in Genesis 37 verse 35. And all his, that is Jacob's sons and all his daughters, arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Because Father Jacob was convinced that Joseph was, he was dead. So he says, I'm going to keep on mourning. What did Judah do? Judah knew that Joseph was alive. Judah knew he had suggested to sell him to slavery. What did Judah do? Did Judah care about his father? No, the evidence is clear that Judah was a hard-hearted son. Now let's go back to chapter 38, verse 1, and finish that verse off. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. That's verse 1. But a few verses later, verse 12, it says, his friend, Hira the Adullamite. Now please don't misunderstand me. We as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, should make friends who are not part of our faith so we can share with them the love of Jesus, correct? But there's the danger involved that sometimes, as the Bible warns in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, would you read it with me, everybody? Bad company corrupts good character. There is that danger. So unless you and I have wa are walking with Jesus and make sure we are following his guidance, there is that danger. Sadly, in the story of Judah, the thing happened. He became a worldly young man. Now let's go to verse 2. And Judah saw there, where he was living now, a, a, a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. Should Judah have married a Canaanite? What does the Bible say? No, do not marry a Canaanite. Do not marry outside the faith. And instead, what is Judah doing? It looks like he is on his way downhill spiritually, step by step. It appears in the story, seems like he is fighting a guilty conscience. And he is trying to just run away as far as possible, moving away physically and moving away spiritually. The story is very sad. What kind of a man was Judah? I would call him an unfaithful believer. Sad story. Now, I'm going to suggest that, encourage you to read Genesis 38, verses 3 through 10 at home later. There's so much more to the story. We're trying to pack in, just in a short message today, 20 years or more of one man's life, and you know you cannot do that. But the story does tell us that he had three sons. He didn't raise them properly. You can read that later on. Two of those sons were extremely wicked. The first son marries a woman named Tamar. He dies, he dies because he is so wicked, the Lord put him to death. The second son marries the, uh, Tamar, and he is also put to death by the Lord, and they end up with no children. And uh, it, it's a tragic story. Two wicked sons who both die, and uh, now we pick up the story in verse 11. Now, note, notice how verse 11 reads. Then Judah told Tamar, his daughter-in-law, not to marry again at that time, but to return to her parents' home. She was to remain a widow until his youngest son, Sheila, was old enough to marry her. Back then, this was a leveret marriage system. The oldest son gets married. If he dies, then the second son must get married and hopefully raise up an heir. But both older boys had died. So Judah says, go home. Wait there until Sheila is old enough, then you can marry my youngest son, so that we can raise up an heir. But notice what the Bible says, the same verse. It says, but Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid Shelah would also die like his brothers. 
So was he an honest man? So Tamar went home to her parents. What do you think of Judah? He was a deceptive father-in-law. Now, it's interesting you're saying, oh, no wonder I've never heard a sermon about this man. This was a really bad guy. <laughs> All right? And we have just started the story. There's a lot more. Because now the story turns really dark. A very, very sad chapter in the life of Judah. The story is so dark. He actually, without realizing it, he uh, is going out for pleasure, so-called. He got, gets his own daughter-in-law pregnant. Wow. What kind of a man was Judah? He was an immoral older man. And then Genesis chapter 38, verse 24 says, about three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Hmm. Hmm. One wonders if Judah, if Judah suddenly realized, is, is this the woman that he didn't really know he had been involved in? Oh, he doesn't give her any chance to prove a point or anything. He is what we call a quick-to-condemn judge. This is the man, the brother of Joseph. And this story is put in the Bible between the story of Joseph. Are you with me? Fascinating. Now, now people are saying, Pastor, who? These, these stories in the Bible, they are very unlike human stories. We love, as humans, to have heroes, right? We put them on pedestals as though they are paragons of perfection. Our heroes have no faults. Hold on. Listen to what the Bible does. Inspiration faithfully records the faults of good men, those who were distinguished by the favor of God. Indeed, their faults are more fully presented than their virtues. It is one of the strongest evidences of the truth of Scripture that facts are not glossed over, nor the sins of its chief characters suppressed. Mm. So God inspired the Bible. In other words, Scripture tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And the Bible also tells us not to excuse it, but it highlights the fact that Judah was raised in what we call a dysfunctional family. Don't forget that his grandpa Laban was greedy and a deceiver. He was raised, Judah was raised in a polygamous fighting family. His oldest brother Reuben was weak-willed. The next two brothers older than him, Simeon and Levi, were murderers. They were cruel. His uncle Esau was immoral and godless, etc. His father Jacob was a deceiver and spoiled. Ah, but that, that was before Jacob met Jesus. That was before Jacob had his name changed from the deceiver to Israel, the one who fights, who battles, and who overcomes with God. Yes. But remember that Judah was raised in that terrible, crazy situation. The reason I want to spend a few moments on that is because sometimes people say, but pastor, you don't know my home life. You don't know my background. You don't know where I've come from. Hold on. God knows. And that's why I love Psalm 87, verse 6. That's the one verse I want us to look at right now. So we're in the book of Genesis, but we're going to make a little tangent to that book called the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms. Psalm 87, verse 6. Different Bibles phrase it slightly differently, but the same message is there. Psalm, and it's easy to remember. If you were to get discouraged, don't forget. 8, 7, 6, like you're counting down, right? Psalm 87, verse 6. One of my favorite verses, this is what the Word of God says. The Lord will record, God will take note, when He registers the peoples, this one was born there. Are you with me? And of course, that one was born there. What is the saying? God knows where we are coming from. God understands our family issues. God takes that into account. And so keep that in mind. Don't become discouraged. We have a loving God, a forgiving God. Let's move on in our story to verse 25 now in Genesis 38. But as they were taking her, that's Tamar, out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns this identification seal and walking stick is the father of my child. <laughs> Do you recognize them? Now, if you read the story, you read it at home, ah, Tamar knew exactly what she was doing. If you read the story, you will know that we know to whom those items belong. The walking stick and the identification seal belong to whom, do you think? To Judah, 
right there. And now Judah has another opportunity to face reality. The last time when his father, Jacob, was weeping and wailing day in and day out, very likely the Holy Spirit was working on his heart, but Judah decided to run away and to try to run into pleasure to quell his guilty conscience. Now, there he's facing another opportunity. He was the father of the clan. He probably could have said, Aha! I've been looking for my identification seal. I've been looking for my walking stick. I should have known it was this wicked, wily woman. Ah, look what happened when my oldest son married her. He died. Look what happened to my second son when he married her. He died. It must be this woman is bad news, but thank God Judah didn't do this. This is what happened. So Judah, what? Acknowledged them and said, she was right and I was wrong. Because I did not give her to Sheila, my son. And he never knew her again. Here in this text is a hint of hope for a heart change. And in the text, by the way, you could preach a whole sermon on that one text because there are three steps of transformation, of change in that one text. He acknowledged them, number one. Yes, acknowledged. The next thing, he admitted she was right and I was wrong because I did not give her. There he said, so he acknowledged that that's mine and admitting his mistake and then he acted and he never knew her again. Aha, so there's acknowledge, admit, act just in that one verse and there's a beginning of a change and how does change happen? Not on our own, friends. The Bible puts it clearly in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Read with me. The goodness of God leads you to what? To repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. We cannot pull ourselves up, as they say, the English idiom, by our own bootstraps. No, it's the goodness of God. You know the story that Jesus told in the New Testament, the story of that young boy who had strayed away. We often call it the story of the what son? Prodigal son. Now, what's interesting, that's the story Jesus told, in the, and we find it in the New Testament. I believe that Judah was the original prodigal, okay, who had strayed away. And so when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, as the artists are so beautifully captured here, the father was standing there with open arms, ran up to meet him, to welcome him home. And now when we go to the story of Judah, what do we see? Did Judah really turn around? That hint of hope for a heart change, did it happen? What happened? Ah, let's pick up the story after we cross over the stories of Joseph in chapter 39, where he stood for the right, though the heavens fall, you know the story. And in his righteousness, in standing what's for right, he was thrown into prison. We talked about that during the week, how unfairly Joseph was treated, but how Joseph survived by taking his misery and turning it into ministry. If you haven't heard the message, go back and Watch what's online from misery to ministry. We talked about that. And we challenged you, those of you who are here, to do the same. If you are ever in a difficult, terrible disappointment, don't complain. Okay? Instead, turn your misery into ministry, just as Joseph did. But we have to go all over those, and we have to move on to chapter 42. That's where we pick up the story of Judah again. Don't miss this important fact. I know we've all heard about Joseph, but so many times, myself included, even though I was raised in a Seventh Avenue family, I don't ever remember hearing about the story of Judah. Hence, this is such an exciting story because chapter 42, verses 2 through 4, read as follows. And he said, this is Jacob the father, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Remember, there was a famine in the land. Go down now and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. Now notice the Bible says, so 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. By the way, how many brothers were there altogether? 12? Now, I'm, I'm implying that maybe Judah has come back. How do I know? Because the verse continues. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. So if there are 12 brothers, Okay, Benjamin is kept at home. Joseph is in Egypt. We know the backstory. And if it says 10 brothers were sent, what does that mean about Judah? What had happened, friends? What changes had happened? Judah returned to his family and to his faith. What do you say? And now that's implied, but let's get more evidence, okay? They went down, they got the grain, they came back, and what happened in chapter 43? When the grain they had brought from Egypt was almost gone, what? 
Jacob said to his sons, go again and buy us a little food. But who? But Judah said, I told you he'd come home. But Judah said, the man, who is the man? Joseph, we know the backstory. <laughs> Judah didn't know. Jacob didn't know. Nobody knew. The man wasn't joking when he warned that we couldn't see him again unless Benjamin came along. If you let us, let him come with us, we will go down and buy some food. Ah, now, remember the first time they went down? Jacob, the father, said, I'm not going to let Benjamin go. Oh, can't, I can't let him go. Already, Joseph is gone. He's dead. Jacob thought, I can't let Benjamin go. And, and, and now Judah says, we cannot go. Because the man, the prime minister, who we happen to know, because we know the backstory, we know it's Joseph, all right? But they don't know. So what happens? Let's fast forward to verse 8, 9, and 11, and 13. But Judah said to Israel, that's Jacob's other name, his father, send the boy with me, and we will all arise and go, that we may live and not die. Three generations, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Israel said, what? Take your brother. What does that imply? It's very clear that Judah had developed into a trusted son. <laughs> Interesting. The father trusts and said, go ahead, go ahead, I, I trust you. I know you'll bring my baby brother, my, your, my, my youngest boy back. And you know what happens in the story, you know the back story. So for a moment, just to remind you, they got onto Egypt, right? And when they got down there, ah, Joseph recognized them and he recognized Benjamin. You know the story, right? And then he said to his people who helped him, hide in Benjamin's sack my special cup. You know what happened. Right? And then, of course, once they're gone, go back and catch them and, and, and open, have them open their sacks. And when they opened the sack of Benjamin, there was the cup. And so they said, okay, Benjamin has to go back as a slave. And all the brothers said, no, no, we're all going back together. You remember that. And so they go back, back to Joseph, back to the man. They don't know it's Joseph. We happen to know that. All right? They go back to the man. Oh, and when they get there, notice what the Bible says in chapter 44, verse 14. And Judah, his brethren also, cometh in unto the house of Joseph, and he is yet there, and they fall before him to the earth. Notice, in, they phrased it clearly, Judah cometh. His brothers were just kind of all behind him. <laughs> now, he wasn't the oldest. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, he was, Judah was the firstborn. And so Judah comes and he falls down in front of Joseph and he says, please, we will all be your slaves, right? Notice in chapter 44, verse 16, and Judah said, oh my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we plead? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. My Lord, we have all returned to be your slaves. We and our brother who had your cup in his sack. Interesting. Now, they were con apparently convinced that Benjamin had done what? He had stolen the cup. And so they said, we'll all be your slaves. Now, it's interesting. In a nutshell, Judah had become a valuable spokesman. Now, what's fascinating, from the next verse, verse 18, that is, Okay, because the, 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 the prime minister responds in verse 17. And now, listen carefully, everybody. From verse 18 of chapter 44, through the end of the chapter, verse 34, we find the longest, are you hearing me? The what? The longest speech in the entire book of Genesis. And guess who's making the speech? Who do you think? It's Judah. The longest speech. And he starts by, then Judah stepped forward and said, my Lord, let me say just this one word to you. Please be patient with me for a moment, for I know you could have me killed in an instant as though you were Pharaoh himself. He doesn't know he is talking to his younger brother. He has no idea. Okay? And, and he makes a long appeal. You can read the whole that whole section at home. But I want to skip to verse 30 and 31. Notice what Judah says. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. When he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We will be responsible for bringing his gray head down to the grave in sorrow. 
Clearly, what has happened in the life of Judah? A radical transformation. Can you see it? Judah is a man who cares. And in fact, Judah, earlier on, just a few verses earlier, Judah was reminding the man, that is the governor, the prime minister, we know it's Joseph. He reminded them of what they told him previously. Verse 20, he said, So we said to my Lord, We have an aged father and a young brother, the child of his old age. This one's full brother is dead. Stop there. Wait a minute. When, 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 when they are talking to the, to the prime minister, to this governor, and they say to him, This one's full brother is dead, what are they saying? You are dead. Are you following that? They honestly believed, the whole family believed that Joseph was dead. And Judah, when they were there the first time, said to him, by the way, you are dead. And he just kept talking to the dead man, so to speak, right? But we know the man was alive. <laughs> so he reminds him, this one's full brother's dead. And since he, the baby brother Benjamin, is the only one of that mother, the mother's name was Rachel, and the only one who is left, listen to the last five words, his father dotes on him. That's a nice English idiom for meaning Father Jacob is still playing favorites. He was playing favorites with Joseph. Now he's playing favorites with Benjamin. Interesting. But, but notice what has happened. And you know, that's the reality. Sometimes even adults struggle with our own challenges in our lives. Parents are not perfect, but hopefully by God's grace, parents can also grow. Jacob had struggled with us. He had not yet succeeded in overcoming playing favorites, but he's about to get there. Okay, he's not there yet. Now, what's interesting, the last time when this favoritism had happened, how did Judah respond? He tried to get rid of Joseph. Now, Judah says the father is still playing favorites, but what, uh, what does it happen? What has happened in the life of Judah? Ah, Judah loved his dad despite his dad's faults because the changes that happened in the life of Judah. Then we'll go to the second last verse. We will end with the, the, on, in the book of Genesis on this where Judah says to the governor, please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy and let the boy, that's Benjamin, return with his brothers. Now, don't forget, to become a slave was a fate more to be feared than what? Than death. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 211, paragraph 4. So what is Judah saying in a nutshell? I'm willing to what? Yes. Judah was willing to die for the guilty. Ah, friends, pause for a moment. Think about that. In this aspect of the life of Judah, in this framework here, who does this remind you of? Jesus, who is willing to die for our sins. Judah says, I will, I'll stay to have a fate worse than death. Of course, let's finish our story because you know they went back home. Chapter 45, verse 26, they gave him, Jacob, this report. Joseph is still alive. He is at this moment governor of all Egypt. But he, Jacob, was as one stunned for he did not believe them. Imagine for 20 to 25 years, Jacob was thoroughly convinced that Joseph was what? Was dead. In fact, the brothers believed it. Everybody believed that Joseph was dead. All of those family members. So now what do you think they have to tell him? Oh, now they come and say Joseph is alive and uh, another act of humiliation remained for the ten brothers. They now did what? Confessed to their father the deceit and cruelty that for so many years had embittered his life and theirs. Jacob had not suspected them of so base a sin, but he saw that all had been overruled for good and he forgave and blessed his erring children. Patriarchs and Prophets 232, paragraph 1. Confession time, especially Judah. What changes had happened? Ah, Judah confessed his sins. He made things right. Then, of course, we can fast forward to the end of the story in the book of Genesis, chapter 49, where Jacob's about to die. He gives his last words to his sons. He says, Reuben, you are unstable as water. Imagine standing around your father's bedside, all of the brothers and your dad gives you bad news. You are wicked <laughs> in front of everybody. Then he talks to Simeon and Levi, and he says, you men of violence. Da, da, da. <gasps> then he gives some good news to Asher, will produce rich foods. And, of course, for Joseph, for Joseph, he's 
favorite son who he's been reunited with, he has five verses of blessings. Uh, but don't miss this important point, friends. For Judah, there are five verses as well. Interesting. What has happened? Genesis 49 verse 8 says as follows, Judah, Jacob speaking, you are the one whom your brothers shall praise. Ah, to Judah. He doesn't say that to Joseph. Ha, what's happened? Hold on, friends. The verse continues. Your hand will be the neck of your enemies, the issue of power. And then Jacob makes a strange statement. Don't forget, Joseph had had the dream of his brothers bowing before him. Don't forget that. Now Jacob says, your father's sons. Who are your father's sons? Your brothers. They shall do what? Bow down to you. Wait a minute, Jacob. Are you getting old? Are you forgetful? The dream was for whom? Joseph, and now Jacob says, no, 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 no. Your brothers will do what? They will bow before you. Prestige, praise, power, prestige. What's happening? Oh, friends, go on and read that story of Judah. It's the most amazing story. Verse Chapter 49, verse 10. The rod of authority used by kings will not be taken from Judah, and he will not be without a lawgiver. In a nutshell, the kings will come through the line of Judah. The monarchs, until Shiloh comes, and to him, capital H, shall be the obedience of the people, of the nations. Aha! Who is, what is Jacob predicting right now? The kings will come through your line, the monarchs, but more importantly, the king of kings. The Messiah will come through Judah's line, not through Joseph, no, but through Judah. Amazing. Now, what was happening was kind of strange. How does this happen? Why didn't Jacob say, Oh, and of course you can ask the question, what about Judah's sins? Why didn't Jacob say, you said to sell Joseph, you were a mercenary brother, you ignored your dad's tears, you were a hard-hearted son. What happened to, Jacob, to Judah's sins, friends? They were disappeared. They were covered by the blood of Jesus. That's right, it's a fantastic story. Yes, in a nutshell, Judah is treated by the grace of God as if he had what? Never sin. Not a sin is mentioned. It's an amazing story. And the reason I love it, in fact, I told my wife I'm going to share this story today again. She said, ah, my favorite story. <laughs> because it's a story in which God wipes away the sins of Judah. In fact, Micah 7 verse 19 says it this way. He will cast all our sins, where? Into the depths of the sea. This is how God treats us when we are forgiven through Jesus Christ. Short story before we end here. My best buddy from 1968, circle around his face there, and he's given permission to tell his story. He was like Judah. He was raised, by the way, in a Christian family, in an Adventist family. He drifted away from the Lord. He completely gave, gave up. He eventually became an atheist. My best friend, I cared about him a lot. One day I wrote to him, Hi Cliff, beginning of September 1, Linda and I, together with many others in the United States, embark on a special emphasis on prayer, during which we choose to pray for five individuals, each for 40 days. I was wondering if you'd let me know of any specific requests about which I could pray for you till the end of these 40 days, which ends on October 10. God bless, Ron. I wrote to my best friend. I asked him. I prayed. I know other people were praying. We prayed. We prayed. And praise the Lord. On the 4th of May, 2013, he posted this on his Facebook. Read with me. Today is the most important day of my life. Guess what it was? He was rebaptized. He came back to the Lord like Judah, complete turnaround, like Judah, amazing. And that was not the end of the story, because less than two years later, he wrote this to me. March 17, 2015, Cliff wrote, Hi, Ron, all those years ago, would you and I... By the way, he always writes I with a small letter. He says, I'm not important enough to have a capital. Okay. Would you and I ever imagine that I would be a church elder? Praise the Lord, I was ordained a few weeks ago. When I saw, I got to the email, three hours later, I replied, indeed, praise the Lord. Oh, Cliff, God's incredible grace in your life brings tears to my eyes. Keep on trusting and growing and sharing focused on Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, friends, whether you're a Christian, whether you're Seventh Avenue, those of you watching online, those of you here, remember, it's nothing about us. 
It is only as this passage in Romans 2 verse 4 says, and I want to read, have you read it with me again? Let's read together. The what? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Now, we were in the book of Genesis, so we want to wrap it up by going to the book of Revelation. We were in Genesis chapter, um, mainly chapter 44, verse 33. We want to go to Revelation 5, verse 5, because what's interesting, here is a story in which we find another person weeping. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Just like Jacob was weeping for Joseph, do not weep. Behold, the what? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, one of the reasons I love preaching about the life of Judah is because we correctly tell young people, especially all of us, be like Joseph. Flee when the devil tries to attack you. But the reality of life is too many of us have failed. Many more of us are like Judah, aren't we? <laughs> we have failed. And that's why I love the story of Judah because, you know, the Bible doesn't say the lion of the tribe of Joseph. Uh-uh. No, no, it doesn't say that. The favorite son. It doesn't say the lion of the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn. It says the what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? It's not the firstborn Reuben. It's not the favorite Joseph. It's the forgiven one called Judah. That's what it is. Jesus is named the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Wow. How do I know it's Jesus? Because the next verse tells us that. So here's the concept of the lion. We go to the next verse. Verse 6 says this. And I looked, John the Revelator says, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a what? A lamb as though it had been slain. Yes, friends, there it is. This is a picture of Jesus, our Savior. And just as Jesus is willing, was willing to die for us on the cross, because indeed, Jesus is the lamb, those lamb in the sacrificial system, in the sanctuary system, that lamb was pointing forward to Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, the lion is the lamb. It is who? It is Jesus. It is Jesus. Right now, brothers, sisters, friends, guests, online viewers, as our heavenly high priest, <clears throat> in his final work of ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, before his second coming, Jesus desires to draw, to us to draw nearer home. I share the story of my friend Cliff, because there may be one or two, there may be few of you, who may have been like my friend, my best buddy Cliff, who is still now, more than a decade later, faithfully loving and walking with Jesus. I don't know if there are any here today who may want to respond to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So I want to make two appeals right now. I'm glad our choruses are here. I'm going to ask if they can sing one of my favorites, number 108, Amazing Grace. Firstly, how many of you, by God's grace, if the opportunity arises and God will open the door, would love to share this story of the love of God to others? Let me see. Who will tell the story of Judah? Don't be afraid. Tell people about this most amazing example. I see hands going up in the balcony. Tell people of God's grace. God is willing to call back the bumbling, bungling backslider and transform them into a blessed, beloved believer. God will turn the liar into a leader. That's right. A deceiver into a deliverer. He will do that for you. And of course, my final appeal here. Does anyone want to make a deep personal commitment to this God? I'm going to ask you to stand with me because I want to pray with you. And then, especially during our hymn, we're going to invite those of you who want to, who would, have not yet made the decision. Some of you have made the decision. Praise God, there will be a baptism happening in just a few minutes here. But we're going to invite you to stand with us. And we're going to be singing that wonderful old classic hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. As we stand, I will invite you during the singing of this hymn to come forward to put your prayer requests into the prayer boxes. We'll sing two stanzas, two stanzas. We'll pause, we'll make another appeal. There may be one or two who still want to make the decision, who haven't had the opportunity, or who have struggled to give their lives to Jesus. This is your opportunity to come during the singing of this hymn. Come up to the front, join our pastors here. Amazing grace, 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 